conducted by audio and video conference without a physically present quorum of the Rock Island City Council due to the disaster declaration issued by Governor Pritzker. Because of this order related to COVID-19 public health concerns affecting the city and the state, the mayor has determined that an in-person meeting at City Hall with all participants is not practical or prudent. For this reason, aldermen and staff may not all be physically present at City Hall and physical public attendance by City Hall may be limited. This meeting can be viewed, on, viewed live on Channel 9 for Mediacom customers living in Rock Island or on the city's YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash user slash Rock Island IL slash live. Thank you very much. Do roll call. Alderman Clark. Absent. Alderman Hurt. Here. Alderman Spaghettis. Present. Alderwoman Swanson. Here. Alderman Parker. Here. Alderman Poulos. Here. Alderman Geenan. Absent. Mayor Tomes. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. First up, visit Quad Cities. Dave. I'm putting myself on the clock, Mayor Tomes. <laughs> I figured that would probably be a good thing. That would be a good thing. Um, good afternoon. Uh, Dave Harrell, President and CEO of Visit Quad Cities. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here with you today, Mayor Tomes. Thank you for everything that you do for us. I uh, appreciate your leadership on our board um, and everything you do for our destination. It means a lot to us and uh, obviously to this body. Um, the relationship and partnership that we have with the city of Rock Island is critical to our organization as a private nonprofit entity. And uh, you all have been incredibly supportive throughout our history and uh, really looking forward to uh, today's uh, conversation. <clears throat> Lastly, I want to recognize uh, Mr. Tweet. Randy, thank you for everything. Really appreciate uh, your commitment to our organization. Um, Randy and I have been having some very productive conversations over uh, the last uh, several months. And I think, as you all know, in our industry, it's, uh, it's not been uh, the easiest within the tourism you know, space. But I'll tell you, from my perspective, uh, I firmly believe that uh, we're poised and positioned, and as the market opens up, presents a lot of opportunities for the Quad Cities. So today, we're going to have a conversation about um, cultural tourism and, and really a relationship that I feel uh, directionally will be incredibly uh, fruitful for Rock Island and Visit Quad Cities as we think about um, how we want to frame up and shape uh, what we do in the tourism space, but then also how we can continually create and add value um, not only uh, to the Quad Cities region, but, uh, but specifically Rock Island by, uh, by having um, a, new, uh, a new relationship. Rock Island is, uh, is special. It's, um, it's something that we feel has a lot of uh, wonderful bones and structure. And uh, certainly, I think Visiquad Cities can do some things to effectuate some outcomes that I think you all are looking to um, achieve. So what we're going to do today is maybe touch on a couple key components of a proposal that we would uh, like to present for consideration um, about how we might be able to evoke some things um, within uh, the cultural tourism space and do some things specifically that can add um, some, some positive to Rock Island and directionally where it's going. Now, one of the things I wanted to add before we talk a little bit about um, you know, one of the core components of our strategic plan is I, I'm really um, excited about the direction of where you're um, taking the new relationship with the Chamber of Commerce. They're a wonderful partner of Visit Quad Cities. I think the, the investment and in, in what you're doing on the business side with them makes a lot of sense. And so certainly, I think they're going to be a wonderful collaborative partner. Um, as most of you know, we embarked on a, um, on a broad destination vision and strategic plan uh, for the visitor economy um, about, uh, gosh, I guess we launched it officially during, during COVID. It was about a year and a half process. We engaged a company by the name of Resonance Consultancy uh, to work with us and, 
and really it's a plan, um, not necessarily just for Visit Quad Cities as an organization, but really the community in terms of how we're thinking about um, tourism. Within that plan, and there's 17 core recommendations, there's 92 specific initiatives, and we've created an implementation team that is literally working with our board and our staff to realize some of these um, recommendations and, and initiatives. There's this destination development you know, section. And within that section, it contemplates a cultural tourism uh, direction for the Quad Cities. And it's something that we think has um, a lot of legs. There's certainly some upside to it. And, uh, and we feel like now is the right time to uh, in, embark on this endeavor. So under section 3.1 of this plan, we talk about um, what this is. And there's some specificity in the plan. That plan is available on our website. If you go to visitquadcities.com and click on the About section, there's literally everything that you would need to know about this strategy um, within that plan on our website. We wanted to make that something that was available to the general public, and that was important to us. So a couple things that um, ring true with this plan as it relates to cultural, cultural tourism in this direction is this. I think certainly Rock Island um, already has that brand reputation within the Quad Cities. Certainly it's got um, a national uh, reputation as well. And one of the things that we want to do is essentially make Rock Island the hub for cultural tourism within the Quad Cities. So not only will there be value created specifically for Rock Island, but we're gonna take our plan from a tourism uh, master plan uh, perspective and literally make Rock Island kind of the epicenter for what we're gonna do within cultural tourism within the region. So we think that there's a lot of value with, uh, with this direction. So we've got a few leading goals um, that I wanna to touch on. I think, you know, one, we wanna establish this plan. Um, two, we want Rock Island to, to house and really lead this initiative. We want to be your partner in, in this endeavor. We, we think that makes um, a lot of sense. Um, we're going to create a marketing and activation plan around cultural tourism. And then uh, not only that, we're going to think about how do we leverage the existing events that already happen within Rock Island, but then in the future, how can we maybe create something that can um, incre incrementally drive some more value and awareness and uh, hopefully benefit for, uh, for the city. <clears throat> One of the things that uh, we're working on currently, um, you all know that we, we, had a, or we have a very small um, space across the street from Theo's um, next to the hotel. It's been dormant for, uh, for a few years. And uh, when I arrived, I, I let our team know that we really need to address this space and think about what we want to make it um, for, uh, for the future. And we're going through that process, and then obviously COVID kind of upended some of those plans. So we've been a little bit on pause, but I'll tell you I'm excited about the future direction. We're working with Edwards Creative to really punch up what that space can be and how it can really hub uh, cultural tourism. Um, we're working on that right now. We should have um, some rending, renderings and some visuals that we're going to share um, with Randy, uh, the mayor, and some other key stakeholders, and really feel like that'll be um, a, a high-functioning space for how we want to activate uh, moving forward. We've also let the chamber know, um, Jack Cullen and Paul Rumler, that that space is available to them. Um, if they want to office out of there, um, certainly um, that they can do so. So we feel like that might even be a greater collaboration that, uh, that we can have. So as we think about some of the things that we want to try to achieve with Rock Island and this new relationship, we want to think about some specificity with our service delivery and what we can do um, to form this, uh, this, new, this new partnership. So in looking at your, your plan from 2016, there's really some wonderful things in there. I think there's some synergy within our tourism master plan and the plan that was laid out uh, for Rock Island in, in 2016. And there's a section 4.1 that kind of touches on that. Um, but we feel like we can connect those two together um, to, to obviously create some more um, value. So that's the first thing. How do we take a plan that you've already created and we can add some color and context to kind of bring that to life within the construct of our tourism master plan and those many recommendations that I mentioned. 
Um, secondly, we, um, we've got a responsibility to this marketplace in the region to develop marketing plans. Um, I, we've, we do them better than anybody from a community building uh, perspective. And uh, that is something that we are going to do specifically for the city of Rock Island. Now, we can do those things within the regional framework. But what I love about the Quad Cities is this. I think each market has its own distinct characteristics, its authenticity, its traits. And so we're going to amplify that. What are those special things within Rock Island that we can you know, hopefully highlight as part of this plan? But we are going to build out um, a specific marketing plan just for Rock Island that will fit in to the city's existing plans, the, um, the heritage plan that was identified in 2016, and then working with Randy and the team from an economic development perspective, how does that kind of seamlessly fit together with the things that are happening within the economic development space? Because tourism really is, is economic development. Let's see if this, okay. So I mentioned the chamber. Um, you know, certainly there's, there's some wonderful organizations that we work with. Um, every day. I think we're a collaborative entity um, by nature. And so folks like Dari, um, obviously the Chamber, um, the City, Quad City Arts, all of these organizations that we spend a lot of time with, um, we, we hope to kind of bring that together to, to form this new collaborative network as we attack some of the things within this plan to hopefully bring it to, uh, to life. And then also within our tourism master plan, there's some things within our governance section which really touch on things within the heritage uh, plan that's identified in terms of appearance. There could be um, policy changes um, that we would obviously need to come back uh, to, to council and kind of talk that through as it relates to the visitor economy and the things that we want to try to do to hopefully create some more, um, some more visitation within downtown, within uh, the city of Rock Island, and also uh, the Quad Cities as a region. So we'll make sure that that's you know, part of that overall strategy. Um, the other thing, too, I, I think in looking at um, the financial picture of, of who we are, and what we are. Um, this year has been a challenging, uh, challenging year for our organization, um, as it has been for all destination marketing organizations around the United States. Um, everyone has been impacted, just like the visitor economy has been impacted. So it's not just hotels and overnight stays, but it's really the entire system. It's, it's hotels, it's restaurants, it's transportation, it's small business retail, and it's literally, it runs uh, the full circle. And so with that, we really want to think about um, a budget that makes a lot of sense uh, for us that we can, that we can operate against and, and certainly have having an additional investment to do that. I think we'll, uh, we'll put this plan into motion. But then there's also some things that we feel um, would be aligned with where the city wants to go, um, you know, from a disadvantaged group of people thinking about equity and inclusion, how do we effectuate that into the cultural tourism plan to bring those things to life, and I don't know a market around the United States that isn't going through that right now, so I think that is something that we absolutely are committed to doing and thinking through how, how can we celebrate the diversity of Rock Island and, uh, and bring that into, into motion. So really, you know, in terms of next steps, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that, that you might have, I think, one, we want to initiate um, this, this concept. We already know, like, foundationally what our plan is. We know um, the key strategies and tactical things that we want to achieve. Um, you know, certainly we want to make sure that the, that the council is comfortable uh, directionally with where we want to take this plan, and then get that beyond just visit Quad Cities and the elected leadership, but really think through who are the right stakeholders in Rock Island to kind of bring to the table um, to make sure that, uh, that we're moving this um, down the right uh, pathway forward, and, uh, and then host a kickoff, and then begin implementation. So these are really kind of the next core steps of, of where we want to go. I will tell you there's a lot of work that's already been done uh, behind the scenes. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, I think we're already doing to, to realize some of the outcomes that you're hoping to achieve. But now I think this kind of creates some formalization to that, it creates some structure 
to that. And it's something that we can uh, certainly test the waters and, and really make Rock Island, um, you know, not only a great place to, to live, um, but certainly visit and experience and, and consume um, on a regular basis. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have uh, specifically for me. Um, and just want to say thank you for your time and everything that you do. Again, Randy, I want to um, recognize him. And uh, I think we're ready to go. We, we've got a draft um, of a potential um, MOU and an agreement. And uh, I would love to kind of hear your thoughts on what the what that next step would be. So Mayor Tomes, thank you for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Nope, appreciate that. City Council, anybody out there virtually have any questions? This is all Mr. Gettis. Uh, Dave, thank you for your presentation. Can you hear me OK? I can, yes, sir. The only question I have is with uh, regard to creating an annual budget. That was part of your presentation. Is that still to be done? And if, if it's still to be done, how, when, and where will that be done? So we're in the process right now um, of working on our budget for uh, next fiscal year. So our FY22 will be effective uh, July 1. Um, Randy and I have already had some conversations about what that will look like from a city perspective. And as Mayor Tomes knows, as being um, on our board, um, end of May is when we'll have kind of a first cut. And then ultimately, our board of directors um, will meet June 23rd to formalize the overarching Visit Quad Cities um, budget. But in terms of the specific plan, that we're working on with Randy. I think we've already identified um, an investment threshold and feel like we've got the right kind of pieces of the puzzle within year one to, to move it forward. So does that answer your question, sir? It does. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Any other questions, comments? Mark, you got any? Or? Other than the fact, I'm excited. I, I think that we should celebrate uh, the diversity that we have, and, and mm -hmm. um, I, I look forward to it. Well, that's great. It is. Thank you, sir. If there's no questions, we'll then move on. And thank you very much for your time. And thank you, Mayor Tom. Your leadership. You know, I, I appreciate it, and I'll just I'll conclude with this. You know, it, it's interesting when Resonance Consultancy came to the community to work with us. They're really intrigued about Rock Island, that they see a huge amount of upside and potential, and, uh, and we do as well. And I think there's a lot that we can do um, in collaboration and connection with the mayor and Randy and the team and all of you, and certainly uh, with Chamber and Dari and other partners. So we're excited about uh, moving this down the field and, uh, and look forward to uh, hopefully achieving that objective. So thank you so much for your time. Appreciate right. it. Thank you. Next up, finance, Linda. All right. I have the clicker today. <laughs> Is it? Okay, so good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, last year, Finance Director Stephanie Masson asked one of our investment fund managers to review the city's policy and recommend any revisions. So in October, we received the proposed revisions to the investment policy. So I'm here tonight to present those proposed changes. Also present tonight to provide additional information and answer questions are Ms. Sophia Anastopoulos, who should be online. Are you there, Sophia? Did you? She's on? OK, great. And Mr. Yeah, yes, Linda, I'm here. OK, <laughs> sorry about that. Thank goodness. <laughs> and Mr. Steve Eckerd. So Sophia is the executive director and Chief Investment Officer of Illinois Metropolitan Investment Fund, also known as IMET. She has also worked for the Government Finance Officers Association, where she was responsible for the GFOA's Treasury and Investment Management Initiatives. 
and Mr. Steve Eckert, who is here with me in the council chambers for moral support, <laughs> is the vice president and trust officer for American Bank. He has 30 years of experience in trust administration, wealth management, and public accounting. So these are only highlights of, of their vast experience. So the City of Rock Island investment policy is located within the annual adopt, adopted budget along with other policies. Any changes to the policy requires council approval. The last policy update was in 2008 to include a sentence related to the letters of credit. So why update the policy? Three reasons, legislation, compliance, and the American Rescue Plan that we've been hearing so much about. So legislation, Illinois state statutes 30 ILCS 235 is the Public Funds Investment Act. So in January 1st of 2000, every unit of government in Illinois was required to adopt the written investment policy governing its investment activity. January 9th of 2019, the act was amended to allow public agencies to invest in corporate bonds. So it is recommended that the city update its policy to reflect the state statute language related to corporate bonds. Another legislation, the Sustainable Investment Act this was signed into law August 23rd of 2019 with an effective date of January 1st of 2020. The Illinois State Treasurer strongly encourages public agencies and governmental units to develop a sustainable investment policy. It is not a mandate, but as Sophia says, an aspiration. So anyway, I checked with IMET and they take sustainability into account as part of the city's annual review in terms of governance, environmental issues, social issues, and human capital. They stated the city should add a provision in our policy, just like many other governments in Illinois. And then I checked with PFM, PFM Asset Management, and they stated that no changes would be required to implement the language. They also have the tools and expertise to review issuers for sustainable investing, and it's already part of their process. So we also recommend adding this provision to the city's policy. Compliance. So compliance is the second reason to update the policy. The city's current policy states that no financial institution shall hold more than 20% of the City of Rock Island's investment portfolio. It also states that the Illinois Public Treasurer's investment pool shall not exceed 25%. However, this chart provides a breakdown of the investment portfolio by financial institutions and over time, which has been a couple of decades, the city has not been able to maintain its own restrictive limit of 20%. Now the state statute does not dictate a certain percentage. It just states that the investment policy should include or address diversification of the investment portfolio. And this seems to be 40 to 50%, you know, based on some of the municipalities that I uh, researched, so we are, well, we we'll to the next page. Next chart. So also as stated, the investment pool limit is currently 25%. However, this number has ranged from 43 to 76% over the past 17 months. And our investment pools would include IMET, Illinois Funds, and PFM. So, the 75%, I believe we're looking at is the total amount, but I'll let Sophia correct me if I'm wrong about that one. So to be in compliance with our own policy, 
we are recommending the following changes that no financial institution shall hold more than 40% of the city's investment portfolio, and that the Illinois Public Treasurer's investment pool and other local government investment pools shall not exceed a total of 75%, which is, not, again, not unusual. And Last but not least, the third reason to update the investment policy is due to the anticipation of the American Rescue Plan disbursements. The city's estimated share is 27 million with the first half anticipated to be released by May 10th of next month. So at this time, I am going to turn it over to Sophia to provide additional information regarding the ARP Act and investing considerations for local government. Great. Thank you, Linda. Um, you did a great job when you said Sophia could correct me. There was nothing to correct. So thank you all for inviting me to, uh, to speak with you, Mayor Alderman. Yep. I just have a few slides I want to touch on regarding your investment policy. Um, as Linda mentioned, my background is with the Government Finance Officers Association, where I was very involved in best practices for uh, government, local government, counties, uh, those professionals. And it is a best practice to review your investment policy on an annual basis. That does not mean that you necessarily need to make changes. But uh, I and bankers and investment managers like PFM, I'm sure they appreciate looking at the policy, seeing the date of the most recent update. It gives us comfort that this is a living, breathing document that the, the government turns to. So some points I'd like to make, uh, as I mentioned, it's important, it, well, it's required by state statute since 2000 to have an investment policy. Um, I like to see a procedures manual. This is a way you could memorialize or institutionalize the processes, the procedures, how the Office of Treasury and Investment Management runs. Now is a good time to review the investment policy in light of the ARP funds that Linda mentioned. Uh, the first tranche, the first bucket, should um, you should receive it right around by May 10th, May 11th. Um, just some important points. Know who you're doing business with. So even if you're not doing formal RFPs, gauge the opinion of several of the uh, folks you work with. Linda has talked to PFM. She's talked to me. I understand there's a, a banker today in attendance. Reach out. That's what we're here for. Choose your vendors competitively. Once again, that doesn't mean you need to do a formal RFP, but check with at least three either financial institutions or three bidders. Um, insist on third-party custody. And what that means is that the party that sells you an investment, if you're buying individual uh, treasury or agencies, make sure that they are not holding those securities, that a third party independently holds those. Collateralize the government's deposits. Uh, by state statute, you have to do that. As Linda mentioned, the most recent change to the investment policy before the current changes was to add the language allowing for federal home loan bank letters of credit. It's a good, good, good addition. Uh, GFOA best practice as well as state statute allows for federal home loan bank letters of credit to provide support for you. And basically, the federal home loan banks, that, that's a, a government en, uh, entity comprised of 11 regional banks. And the local banks in each of the 11 banks' respective regions can choose to become a member. To become a member, they have to meet certain um, qualitative, quantitative uh, criteria. And so the Federal Home Loan Bank does due diligence on these banks that are members. So the letter of credit that you get, 
It doesn't depend on the um, credit rating of the bank, but it's a, a governmental, a U.S. governmental agency. So I love them. I love them all day long because um, as opposed to uh, collateralization, Linda or someone else in the office doesn't have to monitor the, uh, uh, the credit quality, uh, the, uh, the value of those securities. So keep a simple cash flow. It allows you to see what you need to have liquid to pay the bills for liquidity and what you can invest out a little bit further. In typical interest rate environments, we know the further out you go, the higher the return. So that's why you want to do a cash flow. Diversify, and that's as simple as don't put all your investments in one basket. That's why you have the 40% in uh, of your funds in a given institution. That's why you have 75% spread amongst local government investment pools. You don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. And lastly, keep it simple. If you don't understand what it means, don't do it. Okay. Uh, can you go back one, Linda? Okay. Sorry about that. Our funds. Uh, forward one, please. Okay, the ARP funds. What are these ARP funds? These are the uh, America Recovery uh, Act uh, funds that state and local governments, local governments meaning uh, local governments plus counties are going to get to the tune of 350 billion. And the requirements of the federal government are that the funds be deployed fast. You gotta think about putting this to work because the goal is to uh, put people to work, to put the economy to work. So it's got to be fast, but it also has to be smart. So you got to plan for it. So these funds can be used to replace revenue lost to COVID, to pay essential workers a premium pay. For infrastructure investment, this is very important for water, sewer, broadband, and other similar investments. You cannot use it to uh, offset tax reductions, so you can't cut taxes and then use these funds to offset that. And um, they can't be used to support pension funds. So you're getting all this money, and for many governments, if not most, it's probably one of the few times that you're getting such a big uh, pool investment funds in one fell swoop. So you have to take a look at the investment policy that you have to make sure that you can invest these funds when you get them. And what I mean is certain financial um, governments have that they could only uh, place their investments, their deposits with local banks. Well, if all the local banks are, uh, you know, you, Rock Island, the city, the county, all sorts of counties, cities, villages throughout the state, they're turning to the same banks. Are those banks going to have appetite for those funds? Are you limiting yourself if your investment policy restricts that? So you want to take a look at authorized investments. You folks have a very expansive, uh, broad investment policy. It pretty much follows state statute, and you want to be flexible especially right now because the local banks might not be able or interested in uh, taking the entire deposit or investment. Uh, so which financial institutions can you do business with? Can you do business with banks in the county, in the state, nationally? I know that you folks do business with IMET, Illinois Funds, PFM. You want to make sure that your investment policy allows for that. Collateralization, collateralization, traditional securities, but also federal home loan bank letters of credit, which you've already made that change. The IntraFine network, it used to be known as promontory, but they're going through a rebranding process. And that's a way to invest, well, rather to deposit your funds with a local bank. If they are a member of this network, what they do is IntraFi Network parcels out 
your deposit amongst numerous banks. There are thousands of banks in this network. So you take advantage of the FDIC insurance coverage, typically $250,000 uh, per financial institution. But as part of this network, it's spread amongst all sorts of uh, banks. What other investments? Securities. Do you buy treasuries, agencies, repos, commercial paper, bonds? The state of Illinois recently allowed bonds. Do you buy bonds? Safekeeping, as I mentioned, make sure that if you are buying those single type securities or those securities on your own, that you have a third party custodian, either U.S. Bank, Amalgamated, uh, I, I don't know if the banker who is with us today, if their bank provides safekeeping custody, but that's something to, uh, to keep in mind. And very importantly, get it done. For local governments, the investment policy needs to be adopted by the governing body. So those sorts of things take time. The funds are going to be arriving in the next couple of weeks. So if you want to make changes to your investment policy, start doing the research, get it in front of this party, this body, and uh, make those changes. So those are the highlights of what I wanted to chat with you about. Please, I, I would love to open it up to, uh, to questions. Uh, real quick, before we get into questions, I did want to give Steve an opportunity to come up. Okay, you thank you, thank you. I wasn't expecting this, so. <laughs> This is strictly off the cuff. Uh, we meet the criteria that was set out. Uh, we, um, uh, we have worked with uh, Linda on the uh, investment policy statement, adhering to the uh, state of Illinois regulations and statutes. Uh, the changes that are being um, uh, recommended are all based on the Illinois state statutes and recommendations. Uh, we have covered that um, with fine tooth comb. We've also used our third party uh, partner, uh, Main Street Advisors, to uh, go over our investment policy and the, and the changes. And um, everything is lining up with, uh, uh, with what it's supposed to be. And I will take questions. Any of the council members have questions? What? Uh, I guess you guys covered it well. Great. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. All right. Thanks, Sophia. And thank you, Steve. You're very welcome, Linda. Appreciate it. Thank okay. You, okay. I, I'm just going to get right. off, okay? All right. That's good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Up next. Community and Economic Development Department. Good evening. I'm not that tall. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're here tonight. We're ready to launch our neighborhood rehabilitation pilot homestead program. We have a property that uh, we purchased at tax auction several years ago. And in the process of reviewing that house, we decided this would be a good house to do this. How this program is going to fit into where we are currently in our consolidated plan and our housing needs assessment. Um, our most common housing problems, this, all of these come straight out of our plans and our studies. So, we're dealing with a lack of decent affordable rental housing, the age and condition of housing stock, a high number of foreclosures, and I can vouch for that. All of us on our floor deal with foreclosures every day. Lead contamination in the aged housing stock and lack of ADA accessible units and housing units with more than three bedrooms. We have a need for owner and rental rehabilitation. 
Over 90% of both owner-occupied homes and 87% of renter-occupied homes were built before 1980. 1978 is the cutoff for lead. Anything built prior to 1978 probably has some kind of lead paint contamination in it, whether it's interior or exterior. Most of the houses in Rock Island were built long before 1978. So this is something that we deal with. We have a grant right now. We're in a consortium with Moline, um, the Lead Healthy Homes Grant. Of that, I think the total homes that are going to be done in that grant are like 100. It covers Silvis, East Moline, Moline, and Rock Island. Rock Island is going to do 50 homes under that grant. We have the most. The needs assessment identified cost burden as the most common housing problem for Rock Island citizens. If, if you're paying 30% or more of your paycheck towards housing, you're cost burdened. And most of our residents pay over 30% of their paycheck towards housing. Also within um, the five-year consolidated annual action plan, um, barriers to affordable housing. And this really has to do with us internally. You know, the negative effects of public policies on affordable housing and, and residential investment. Um, we're part of the metropolitan statistical area, so some of these numbers kind of get all pushed together. But in our study, and this was also in the following impediments were identified, our continued need for an increased supply of decent affordable housing, we don't have that. Lack of geographic diversity in affordable housing options. Accessible housing for people with disabilities is in short supply. Community development planning lacks an equity focus. We're working on that. Protected classes face a barrier to fairly accessing houses and community perception influences housing choice. So all of these things are what we are trying to address in this program. And granted, we're doing this um, one house at a time, but that's what we can do right now. This is from our housing needs assessment. We had 103 responses. We really pushed to get the community to tell us what their thoughts were. And according to the survey, the highest rated needs for renters and homeowners were housing rehabilitation, first time home buyer assistance, home buyer education, and rental housing rehabilitation. We have the first time home buyer pro assistance and home buyer education growth, they have that, those programs. We have the Live Work EAP. We're working on a rental housing rehabilitation program. Once we have a director in place, we'll be able to start moving forward with that. But housing rehabilitation, that is our main focus. That is what we can do. Our CDBG funds do not allow us to do new construction. We are only um, allowed to do rehabilitation. So that's where we're at with this. We have a prevalence of blighted properties, you know, and the largest perceived need the survey, in the survey out of any category was the removal of blighted and dilapidated buildings. And there are areas within our community that have a larger quantity of dilapidated and blighted buildings. And these are the areas that we work on in our neighborhood housing program to help owner-occupied home, homeowners with these issues. This program, we're looking citywide. We're going to go wherever we can find a house to rehabilitate. We're going to go there. 
You know, we're gonna put affordable housing in neighborhoods throughout our community. We're not gonna just focus on certain areas. So 1435 15th Avenue. As I said, we obtained this house at tax auction in 2019. The property was on the demolition li list, but we took a look at this house and we were like, you know, maybe we are getting ahead of ourselves. You know, this house has really good bones. It's in a dilapidated condition, but nothing in this house can't be rehabilitated. Here's the house. We've removed some trees um, and cleaned up around it. We've put some lighting and different things, but the house itself is a wonderful little three bedroom house. The woman who owned the house, she died and it's just been sitting there. It went up for taxes. Um, we used all the money we've spent on this, except for the purchase at tax auction, has been grant funded, 100% grant funded. Um, we removed all the trash, we removed the trees, we did a survey to de determine where the lot lines were. That was a little questionable, you know. Um, we did a lead and paint and asbestos inspection. Um, we had the 100 amp electric service installed. And we purchased some additional feet on the north and on the west side. Um, the west side was critical because in order to meet the, the ordinance for driveways, we needed that extra um, footage. So this is what HUD has paid for to date. $19,797 and a penny. We had um, an abandoned residential property grant, round four, through IDA, and these were eligible costs that we could use that grant for. So instead of doing everything um, using that grant just for demolition, you know, we were like, let's do something appropriate, more appropriate with it. So we used some of our grant dollars and we moved the, all the stuff that was in it, and then we secured the building. Now, now we're at a point where this is not my wheelhouse. Um, these things are code, they're, they're <laughs> current ordinance and um, other regulations. But the scope of our work goes beyond the current codes. We are going to rebuilt this, rehabilitate this home for sale to a family for affordable housing. So there are things that we're going to do in this home that go beyond what the current codes are. And some things, like it still has knob and tube in it. Well, we want to insulate it. This affordable housing, we have to get away from this idea that affordable housing is purchased at a reasonable cost. Affordable housing means that we have provided a home that is energy efficient, their utilities are low. We've done all the things to keep their utilities low, maintenance low, all of those things. That's the affordable part of this. So we're gonna take the walls out. We're getting rid of the knob and tube. We're going to insulate the windows. We're gonna insulate the walls. We're gonna put up those barriers. We're going to do the things that make this house affordable on the back end. Lead and asbestos, that is a HUD requirement and we can't get away from that. So some of the walls have to come out because they have lead in them. The house, the exterior of the house, we have to put up vinyl siding because the paint on the exterior was all came back hot for lead. So we have to encapsulate that. I'm gonna go back. So. It's important to note that a residential property receiving an average of more than $25,000, the full lead abatement applies. We will spend more than $25,000, we almost have. So we have to go we, through the lead abatement process. We're going to use 
our HUD Community Development Block Grant funds. But we also received a Strong Communities Grant from Ida in the amount of $175,000. We can expend up to $40,000 per house for the Ida grant. So to make up the shortfall on the HUD side, we've applied $40,000 of Strong Communities Grant in order to be able to leverage all of our funding. Due to the pandemic, material prices have increased an average of 35%. This has increased our project costs. Um, the cost of lead abatement is going to be $35,000. Again, a cost that we can't not do. <clears throat> we haven't determined a sale price at this time, but we're looking at anywhere between fifty and seventy-five thousand um, dollars. I'm learning how to do underwriting and all these <coughs> other things. So when we have a price for this house, we'll come back to council and let you know what that is going to be. But at the end of the day, the total rehabilitation cost, you know, is going to be roughly anywhere between one hundred and sixty to one hundred and eighty thousand. And then the proceeds from the sale of the, will go, become program income, and we'll continue to use those funds as they come in to leverage other um, rehabilitations. I came to you for the annual action plan. In there, I put $250,000 to do two rehabilitations, um, one for veteran housing and one for, you know, working with the Thrive Program through Community Home Partners. We're hoping that the, the prices for materials comes down so that we get back into line with what we had originally intended. But that's where we're taking this program. You know, I, I've talked about this, and I've brought, we have all brought different parts to you um, about this program. This is just the whole package. So in summary, um, this is a pilot program. We've already gained a lot of insight into this. Um, we will be developing policies and procedures so that when we actually get done with this house, we'll have a way forward. Those policies and procedures will come to the council for approval. This program is going to do those things. It's one house, but one house at a time, you know, that's what we can do. And, uh, and I feel very confident that if we can grow this program and we can start to show some really good um, outcomes, that we have the opportunity to actually go back to HUD and apply for home funds. And if we can apply for home funds, we can do even more, you know, but we've got to get there and we've got to show HUD that we can do this and we can do it well. And you know, we're putting a vacant and abandoned buildings back on the ta tax roll. We're not tearing them down and then being left with a vacant um, piece of property. And, you know, it's just an additional thing that we get to do as part of our affordable housing and housing rehabilitation programs. So I will take any questions that anybody has. Any questions from the council? Um, this is Alderwoman Swanson. I think it's a great idea what we're doing. My concern is, and, and I know that the, the CDB grant money needs to be used for different things, but putting at what point do you determine that it's not cost effective to put so much money into a house that's only going to be fifty to seventy thousand dollars. Well, as I said, we're hoping that the the costs come down. We're looking at other programs, and I don't really know what that threshold is going to be, but it's something that we're going to have to figure out. And you know, we're going to have to. You have some dad. Miles has some dad. So I'm going to let him come up. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> 
So one of the elements uh, to keep in mind with this uh, project is not just that it is a pilot, right? So it's a test run. We're, we're trying things out. We're seeing kind of what works. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is, is that it's not just about the house itself, but the message that it sends, right? So we're investing a lot of money in this house in order to make a statement about investing money in the neighborhood. Hopefully, we'll inspire not just uh, support for this kind of uh, government-led action, but also neighbors to try and invest some of their own money in their own properties. Um, you know, at the house, just doing some of the things we've already done, we have had neighbors approach us with some questions. And, you know, it's a slow process of trying to, you know, turn neighborhoods over. Uh, we can't rehab them all, but we can inspire people to continue to rehab their own houses. Um, it may be something small, like maintaining their yard a little bit better because we've taken out some, you know, scrubby trees. It might be something larger, like putting a new siding on their home or something to that effect. So, you know, when we look at this number, it's important to think, again, we're kind of doing a test run here, so we're trying some stuff out. We may not spend that much money in the future on other houses, but we need to know how things will work out with this one, which is kind of why it's fortuitous that it's a slightly larger house so that we can kind of get a sense of what things will really cost on a house this size. But two, again, trying to do some sort of inspirational work uh, and really try to motivate people to th look at their neighborhood a little bit different uh, and, and maybe put some money into their own house. The other thing that will come out of this too is a set of policies that will be adopted by council. So part of what we're learning here is, is what those policies are going to be. So there will be a, a set policy that would have an investment limit on it that council would approve at some point in the future. I, we do have the, some construction folks here from our staff that can answer any questions about any of the specific work that's being done also. Yeah, we have uh, Jeff Laxton, the construction officer, who's really going to be serving as our uh, project manager, working closely with the uh, contractor to kind of shepherd the project through. We also have Tim DeLathauer, the interim chief building official present. This is Alderman Spurgettis. I don't have any questions, but I think um, this is an excellent pilot program. It makes good, good use of available grant money and provide... Uh, improved housing in the city of Rock Island. So thanks very much. Any other questions, comments? Uh, yes, this is Alderman Hurt, I have one. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, in regards to the Edwards, how is that just on the city? How, how do we decide who? Where those grants are. Alderman Hurt, you, we, we heard the first couple of words, then you broke up. We heard about every third word. So could you repeat that again or move someplace else? Okay, can you hear me better now? Yes. Okay. So as it, as it pertains to the lead removal grants, how is, what's the, what's the process for determining who receives those? I'm not so for for the lead. Are you talking about the lead safe, healthy homes? Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, just how to apply for that assistance separate from the rehab house that we were talking about. That's correct. It was mentioned early on in the presentation, oh. and I was kind of curious as to the process. Sure. Well, uh, uh, like any of the assistance we offer, there are some um, uh, various uh, uh, requirements of the applicant to be income eligible to have a child under six who's tested high for lead in a, in a lead blood test. Uh, but if uh, that is a concern or if you have any eligible uh, folks or interested folks, all they need to do is reach out to Nicole Mata, uh, who is our housing and loan program officer up in the CED office, and she can process all of those applications. And we'd be happy to take some because, like Colleen mentioned, you know, the bulk of the target uh, for homes assisted through that program are here in Rock Island and not in our partner communities that we're working with on that. So uh, we have a lot of homes <laughs> in Rock Island that uh, have some serious deteriorating lead-based paint. So we'd really like to get as many applicants as possible. If you know anybody who might be eligible, or you think might be eligible, have them contact us. So, so yeah. which brings up a second question, follow-up to that, Miles. Yes. Um, so while those are available to the residents, 
how are they being made aware of this? Because, I mean, is it somewhere on mm -hmm. our city side, or, or yep. how, do, how do they know this? So uh, one of the biggest uh, things that we've been doing uh, to leverage the partnership is really pooling resources to get the message out. Uh, our partners have done radio ads, have been interviewed on the news, we do frequent social media postings, we've done mailers, uh, and we will continue to do all of those different things to try and get the word out. It is on our city website, uh, like all of our programs are uh, discussed there. Um, so we're trying our best, but you know how it goes. You know, people only see what they <laughs> what they see, and uh, how as much as I uh, think that we're doing a good job, we could always do a little bit better when it comes to the messaging and the marketing. Uh, you know, since it's come up here, I would just say to all of the council members, any assistance you can provide in getting the message out about that program or any of the programs that we offer, but especially that one right now, would be greatly appreciated. Um, we have a lot of residents who would be eligible for that assistance, and there's a lot of dollars on the table to get them that assistance. So uh, any, any help with that, we would we'd greatly appreciate. I would ag I would agree with that. I just I you know my concern is maybe the people that are needing it the most probably aren't the, the message isn't getting out to them. We that share the we share that question. concern. Yep, we share that concern, and and you know that's that's one of the biggest challenges. If you've got a, a family of very modest means and everyone's working uh, you know as many hours as they can to keep food on the table and everybody's busy all the time, you're not necessarily going to see every message we put out. So yeah, any any help any help to get that message out, we'd appreciate it. And we can provide uh, more information about the program, including uh, promotional materials, pamphlets, and the like, uh, to any council member who'd like to distribute them in their ward or do anything like that. Okay, oh, water. thank you very much, Miles. I appreciate it. Yep. The water bill. Have we tried to put it to notice in the water bill? Um, we've talked about it, but we haven't done that yet. Um, that's something that we we may yet do. I mean, just about everybody gets those. Whether true. Know, yep. Uh, the landlord might if they're renting instead of the uh, person there, but sure. either way. Um, real quick, so we got enough money to do 50 homes, uh, I think, in the, lead. in the lead deal. And how many, have we got any signed up yet? I don't know when yep. it started. We, uh, we've got, I'm trying to think, because uh, they're all at, the, you know, each the process for tracking all of them drags on. Do you know how many we've completed? Yes. So to this point, we've done, pardon me. That's right. Um, we've done 12 units. Um, one has been, is a rental. Rental um, properties are eligible, um, but they have to agree to put a um, income qualifying family in it for at least three years. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so there are um, caveats to that for rentals, but rentals are also eligible to have lead abatement. How many have we done before in different years that we've had? We've had this grant over a number of years. Uh, we've received uh -huh. this grant, and there's been a few times we couldn't use it all. We just didn't get enough applicants in or whatever. But I don't have any numbers. I'm really sorry. You mentioned, though, you know, not being, we're not getting enough applicants. I mean, that, that is the biggest challenge, really, to these is just getting enough applicants. I mean, that, that's really the number one problem because actually doing the work, it's all pretty straightforward. I mean, you know encapsulating things if you can, removing them if you can. It's, it's straightforward stuff, so it's, it's not hard to do, really. It's just getting enough people to sign up for it. Well, we know that we have enough people. They just need to fill out the, yeah. the application. And we've got enough staff in-house in to be able to Well, and again, we're not, it's not just our in-house staff working on it. I mean, we're partnered with Moline, East Moline, and Silvis, so we're sharing uh, staff and working together to move it all forward. So, you know, between us, we have enough people to get the job done. It's just about getting applicants. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that program, but I, I do want to make sure in the time that we have together to address any other questions or concerns about the rehab house and the pilot homestead program. So if there's any other question about that, I think we'd love to, to take those. Sounds like there's none. And again, we have, our, we have our construction officer and the chief building official here. So if there's any questions about any of the details, this would be the time to, time to do it. We, we wanted to make sure that we move forward on this um, in pretty quick order here. We have a contractor ready to start as soon as uh, the next council meeting can, uh, at where the co contract for um, the work can be approved. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of subs involved in the job. We have jobs lined up. So 
we want to make sure that if there's any concerns, we hear them now um, because we don't want to delay any any further. Yeah. In some cases, getting the building materials are getting expensive. The lumber, it's, especially. It's it's not only that this is getting that problem. Yes, and we've <laughs> seen that in our uh, regular rehab program is that some materials they're not just you know. <laughs> four, five, six times more expensive than they were a year and a half ago. But they're also on back order and back order and back order. You know, you place order for a window and it takes, you know, two months to arrive. So we're having a lot of, that's, that's again kind of our concern with waiting is that the costs and the lag times will continue to mount. Um, so. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the items we had on the agenda for study session. So we will uh, reconvene at 6.45 to start the meeting.